Yep. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks. Thanks for our Lord Jesus Christ who came among us, who touched people's lives, including our own. We thank you that he healed, he taught, he led, and he died for us, only to rise and give us the promise of eternal life. And so we pray today that that you would be with us so we might find strength through our faith, we might grow in our understanding, and we might be your people at this time and in this place. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray that uh, also, hi Carol, also that uh, the Lord has watched over Judy and her knee replacement and uh, uh, maybe she'll be able to be, I, I won't encourage her to be back next week if her knee isn't healed. <laughs> yeah, I just don't know how far it's gone. So, uh, and Joseph Carol died. Who? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, we're on the fourth week. Jesus is the question. Um, I think we found out by now that uh, uh, where we've been and where we're going, I wanted to let you know on this because we kind of turn a page this week. Um from going to questions about something to questions that Jesus answers. And then we'll bounce back to questions from the cross. If you happen to have the book, and I know a couple of you do have the book, uh, you're going to have to jump back on, for next week, I think, to the very first chapter. No, three. three. Chapter 3, where Jesus says who he is. So um, we'll get at that next week. Anyway. I thought I'd give a couple little slides here of introduction. You know, why does Jesus ask so many questions? 307 of them he asks in the Bible. And he only answers three, maybe as many as eight. But we're going to get at that in a couple weeks. So, a little man says, and I, I felt it's time that we really named this class for what it is which is Jesus is the questioner and not Jesus is the question. But we wanted to catch you, you know. We wanted to get people out. And um, uh, Pastor Bruce and I have already talked about a class that I want to do in the fall that's going to be entitled, uh, God Said, Go Take a Hike. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll look at Abraham and we'll look at the... Look at, uh, Moses and the Exodus and the trip to Babylon and back and Mary and Joseph coming down to Bethlehem, kind of following Adam Hamilton's journey on that one. And uh, then Jesus uh, thing. And um, we'll end up with God telling me to go take a hike. And, and, and that'll be, the, the I think, the seventh week. Anyway, Jesus is the questioner. So why ask questions? Why doesn't Jesus just stand up and give a lecture? Um, and the answer is relatively simple. Number one, in those days, good rabbis ask questions. Um, if you look at the Talmud and uh, how they taught right after Jesus' time in the first couple of centuries after uh, Jesus' birth, their whole quote, as I call it, like their catechism, which they still utilize, uh, is all questions and answers. Um, but it's also to ask questions is to help you and me find the answers. Um, you participate in discovering the answer, and you know that whenever you're involved in something, that uh, it requires a question that you answer, you remember it better than something that's just like that. Um, Isn't that what psychiatrists do? 
Isn't that what psychiatrists do? Some of them do that. Uh, if they're Rogerian or Jungian, um, you, will, you will hear them say, so that's what you were asking? Or, you know, you don't feel well? You don't feel well? You know, they just ask you back what you ask them, so, um, or tell them. But you participate in discovering the answer. Once you've found your answers, then you will operate accordingly. So, when the lawyer asks Jesus, who is my neighbor, we're hopeful that that lawyer has learned who the neighbor is through the story of the Good Samaritan. So, I like this. We're going to turn parables into questions today as well as we're going to turn parables or miracles into questions when we get to healing. Um, we'll see how that works. But when we turn parables into questions, think in terms of Jesus telling the story of the par parable of the sower. That's my wife probably telling me that we're not on live stream. You want to, right here. We, give her my cell. Give her your cell. Live stream is not on. I'm, you know, I'm going to answer her, if you don't mind. I wasn't going to give her all that information. There. Should have gone. Okay. I knew that's who it was. So, when Jesus tells the parable of the sower who goes out to sow seed, you can look at it from being the sower or the soils. What kind of soil are you? And once you understand that, then you begin to understand where you have to go to become a different kind of soil if you need to become a fertile soil in the end. So that's how the parable gets turned into a question. Are you like a mustard seed, just a tiny little bit, that you hope will grow like a little pinch of leaven? Um, would you look for a hidden treasure or a pearl of great value? Something of great value. I, I lost, I don't know if I lost it or it got stolen. Uh, I hate to put it that way, but my class ring from seminary uh, came up missing probably three, four years ago. It was right at the time the guys were working on our bathroom, putting the tile down in the bathroom and on the floor, and I didn't recognize that it was missing for about a week or so. And it, it's still, you know, I've pulled the chest of drawers out from the wall and looked underneath and all. Um, but what's amazing is if it got stolen by one of those two guys, um, that sitting right next to where my ring was, was a little bit of money. Why didn't they take the money if they took the ring? Um, so I don't know. But... You know, when you have a, a treasure and you lose it, you go searching for it. Sometimes you search for things that aren't treasures. <laughs> and you get to be our age, you walk into that room and say, now why did I come in here? You know, what was it that I was after? Or a pearl of great value. Okay, under what circumstances would you look for it? depends upon the situation in which you find yourself. Why would you pay the labor? What would you pay the laborers in your vineyard? Okay, you own the vineyard. Okay, you two came and worked all day. Okay, Roger came about uh, noon. And Carol came about three. And finally, Nita showed up about 5.30. Would I pay you all the same? Now, today, uh, <laughs> that is still 
a very difficult parable to understand. Very difficult to understand. Um, in Pastor Mark's sermon this weekend, did he preach Sunday? He preached Saturday. He, Saturday. Saturday. And he told, you know, the person who comes up to him at the door and says, I want to talk to you right now about your sermon. Yeah. You know, that happened to me only once in 55 years. And it was on that parable, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. And I said, Herb, just wait a minute till I greet everybody and I'll talk to you. And he waited. And uh, he was a unique individual, always in my class, always asking good, fairly good questions. One of those good students to have when they ask questions. Um, and he worked for um, the Bureau of unemployment or something, giving out money, you know, to people that needed it. So he, he should have been aware. Maybe that's why he asked it. So I thought I had squared away with him. The next week, I always had Sunday school between the two church services. And I'm in there teaching, and his hand goes up. He says, before you begin, Pastor, could you tell us again about those laborers in the vineyard? <laughs> so, uh, you know, he could still be up in Michigan somewhere worrying about <laughs> the laborers in the vineyard, no, no uh, What? That was his thing. That was his thing, right. What about the ten maidens? Five had their candles ready and five didn't. You know, are you ready or not? This is how parables get turned into questions. And you'll note, we have question marks here on all of those things. Okay, but today we're going to look at two subjects. Jesus is going to ask questions as they relate to healing, and then when we finish that, questions about abundance. So let's look at healing first. Healing always begins with the asking of questions. Anytime you go into a doctor's office for the first time, what do they do? They hand you a bunch of papers and say, fill it out. Sign it on the last page. Put your initials on this page. And so the, the healing always begins with the asking of questions. I mean... I don't, if I went into my um, PCP, my primary care physician, and I had a bad foot, which I did, if I didn't tell him about it, and he didn't ask the question, is everything all going all right, then I would tell, then I told him about my foot, then he sends me to a podiatrist who hasn't done me a bit of good, but that's all right. Uh, <laughs> But what is your name? What is your birth date? Everybody wants to know your birthday because that's how you're in files at doctor's offices. So then the doctor sees you. Here, I, I mean, you check in, you fill out your forms, you take them up to the window, and you give them to the person. They say, have a seat, we'll call you back. And in about 15 minutes, they call you back and then you sit in this room, someone takes your blood pressure and, and your pulse rate and asks you what medicines are you taking, and then they leave. The doctor will see you in just a minute. And you sit there, 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 and wait and wait and wait. Well, the doctor finally comes in and he sees you. And what does he say? <clears throat> How long has this been happening? Has this ever happened before? Are you in any pain? How often does this pain occur? You know, the list could go on and on and on. To help you with your healing, the doctor is going to ask you all kinds of questions. These questions are routine and they're asked right on the spot, but they are essential. They're essential to proper diagnosis and treatment. Okay, now 
the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are filled. No, John is not. But the Gospels basically are filled, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, with examples of healing. Diseases from epilepsy to blindness to crippled. You can go down the list of those whom Jesus dealt with. Miracles in the Gospels. And I, I just thought I, uh, I'm going to show you uh, where they're found. Um, miracles in the Gospels are called signs. Signs. There are nine in Matthew, five in Mark, eight in Luke, and six in John. And so you see the listing of the miracles. All the writers literally say they were signs or people ask for a sign from Jesus. Uh, it doesn't call them miracles. The definition of a miracle from the Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible is an event, whether natural or supernatural, in which one sees an act of re or revelation of God. And there's that key word again, revelation. What Jesus does is to reveal. And that's different than just answering. So, there we have one that you're going to hear about when we get to abundance. Miracles in the Gospels. Um, what can we learn from an outline overview? And here's what I mean by that. There are 33 miracles in the Gospels. 19, what was, what did I have back here? Oh, it's where they're called signs. Okay, now we'll get to the real miracles as they occur, not always called signs. And so, there are 33 in the Gospels. There are 19 in Matthew, 17 in Mark, 19 in Luke, 8 in John, and 6 of John's miracles that he describes are different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So he only repeats two of them, which is interesting. Um, it's interesting that you could say John was writing 25 years later than Mark. So maybe he knew about all of them already at that point. Yes, Joe. I got a question here, but I'll, re I'll repeat it. I'll repeat it. Why did they wait so long to write? Why did they let wait so long to write? Right. Now, that's a good question. See how we learn from questions. And the answer is relatively simple. Maybe I oversimplify it in saying this, but they expected Jesus to return very imminently. They didn't expect it to go on for years and years. Okay. Carol, did you have a question? No, that, that was your answer for her. Okay, <laughs> I'm glad. Okay, now we look at, at how these miracles occur in those Gospels, and we learn some things. Matthews are tightly bunched. In fact, they come pretty soon, right after the Sermon on the Mount. Luke's are spread out throughout the whole gospel. Um, Mark's all happen before chapter 9. Mark's, there's 14 chapters in Mark. All of his happen before Jesus says, who do you say that I am? That will be one of the questions, of course, we talk about. And how many of those in Mark deal with physical healing. So overall, if there are 33 in the Gospels, 24 of the 33 miracles have to do with physical healing. A non-physical healing miracle 
would be feeding the 5,000, something like that. Wine water. Water into wine. Water into wine. Okay. The great physician gives us signs. The great physician is also the great questioner. Each and every healing starts with a question. Many sound like the question of a modern doctor. Think about that. Here's some examples. The man is tormented by demons. Jesus says, what is your name? And what does he say? My name is Legion. So there, Jesus immediately learned something about his personality, schizophrenia. Man, man brings the boy with a seizure. What does Jesus say? How long has this been going on? The blind man begs for sight. Jesus heals and says, do you see anything? Remember, he sees shadows that look like trees. And then Jesus puts a little more mud in his eyes. And he says, now I see people. Think how doctors ask us our history and our family's history. You know, I, I really think about this often. Nah, maybe not quite that often. Maybe I ought to think about it a little bit more. Uh, when I go to the room and can't remember what I went in there for, um, or if I go to the store and uh, I, oh, I keep all those things in my mind. We don't have to write them down. And, and I forget one. Okay. Think how doctors ask our history. How long have you had these symptoms? Are you allergic to certain medications? And some of you had that, all of us that have had uh, a shot, a uh, COVID shot, know that they're going to ask you that if you're allergic to medications. There's one that they're making you wait a half hour instead of 15 minutes. Um, I don't take it, so I don't know. Okay, if my mind starts slipping, I can think of my family history. When I think of my family history, my grandmother had dementia when she was from 90 to 95 years old, almost bedfast at that point. Um, and it got toward the end of the fourth year or so, because she didn't speak at all the last year, um, toward the end, she just kept talking about getting lost. Where's my father? Where's my father? Where's my father? Because she did get lost when they came to America and she was six years old. She got lost in the crowd as they were getting off the ship. But they found her okay. But she had dementia. My mother had dementia from 87 to 90. And I knew two of those years very clearly because she lived with us during those two years. And, you know, the signs of dementia were there. One of the signs of dementia is to wander, to wander. And it was about the third time that my neighbor caught my mother wandering up the street that we had to put her into assisted living if Peg and I were both going to still work. Uh, it was the only, only way we could handle it. Um, my brother, my brother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and he died at age 83. Um, Roger knew my brother very well because he went to college where my brother was a senior when we were freshmen in colleges. Okay, as we study Jesus' questions for healing, if the meaning and purpose of life are found in God, what is the role of science in healing? We, we always are dealing with this role today. When we're trying to teach about someone being healed, someone's going to ask some question about 
quote, modern science, modern medicine, if we can call that. You know, think in terms of it, it's going to come up here in a minute, but think in terms of it this way. How many times have you gone into the doctor and have the doctor say to you, what role does faith play in your healing? You don't hear it happen. Now my cardiologist always says, well, what are you teaching now? Because <laughs> he's, he's a died low Baptist, but um, he, he wants to know what's, what's going on. So what is the role of faith? Let's substitute that. What did we learn when we talked about faith and doubt? What's the best word for faith? It's trust. So what is the role of trust here? Do they cross each other, faith and healing, or complement each other? Who knows? This is what we learned today. I don't know why I put that on there. I did. Okay. Prayer and healing or dealing with the whole person. As you see, I've gotten away from the book a little bit uh, today uh, to get into healing. Um, I took a course on healing and salvation in graduate school from Granger Westberg. Okay. But we live in an age when the body is viewed in isolation. You go to a doctor and they view your body. They don't ask you about your faith. That's what I tried to point out. Um, so modern medicine treats the body then as a mechanism. A mechanism to be fixed. Parts can be repaired. Parts can be replaced. Chemical treatments can be administered. I call that lube and an oil change. Um, believe me, if you've been through there, you understand what that means. And, and you begin to, you know, I look back at, at uh, my two bouts with cancer, not, not counting skin cancers. Uh, dermatologists can find something every time you walk in. But uh, speaking of your regular, your PCP, primary care physician, uh, you can be asking yourself um, how is this going to be treated, which, which is a question that I ask um, both times. Well, I should say the first time when I had the prostate cancer, the doctor said, how would you like to treat this? These are your choices. And I chose radiation. 45 days of radiation at 3.30 every day, Monday through Friday. And they wouldn't give you an extra day off on a weekend. Until, this is, this is really interesting, until about halfway through, we came to Labor Day. And they were closed on Labor Day. So I had three days off in a row. Other than that, it was 45 days that I'd go in every day at 3.30. And I don't know if any of you have ever had it. They, they build a, a, a plaster cast or beat it up, whatever they do with it. And you lay in the exact same position every time. <laughs> and it's strange when you go in that they have all these body casts lay, hanging from the wall. Um, and yours has got your name on. They come down and put it on. And then you go through and you listen to tick, 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 you know, as, as it goes over you um, and then comes back. The other way, we really won't get into that one, that was bladder cancer, and, but that was uh, lube and oil change. Um, so we'll just, we'll just leave it at that, okay? Uh, but it was, it was 
chemicals, and it was in, introduced into my system five times. So, you know, this is how a doctor treats your body these days. I'm not saying it's wrong, because it's helped me. Um, and when you think parts can be repaired, parts can be replaced. Um, when I had my open heart surgery, um, some of you I'm sure are aware when it happened that, that uh, it happened as an accident. You know, the doctor went in to fix my atrial fibrillation with, with a little electrode up the back of my heart and on what the way it works is they put a wire in that goes in through your groin and up through your vessel artery and then once that's in then they can put the sheath in the sheath goes and at that point they can pull the wire out they never got the sheath in because he hit my heart with the wire going in and it, Fortunately, he recognized that it was starting to bleed. Fortunately. You know, other people have died from the very same thing happening. Um, and so Dr. Cook just happened to be there, and he was a, he's a heart surgeon, and so I have the zipper, you know, down. But what's neat is if you ever see, and I've seen a, a chest X-ray, of myself, I have these three wires that hold my sternum together uh, where it's gone. So it was repaired. It was repaired. It wasn't replaced. So in Jesus' time, there was no division between the physical and the spiritual. Um, in such a world, there's no way of treating the body and the spirit separately. Thus, spiritual practice like prayer played a strong role in healing. Is that what holistic medicine is? What, holistic medicine is? Um, what holistic medicine is, you take all these 40 pills and they're going to make you a better person and live longer. Um, I like to call holistic medicine I have a, a very, um, st eh, we won't call it a strong feeling. I just have a good feeling about DOs, doctors of osteopathy, osteopathic doctors. They go, they go to just as much training as an MD does. I meant homeopathic. You meant homeopathic, right. I'll, I'll deal with holistic here first. Okay. And, and, <laughs> And uh, the thing is, an osteopath tries to diagnose you from the inside out. What's causing this? And, and of course, a lot of times it ends up, uh, you'll see uh, a fair number of osteopaths who work with uh, bones. Um, and if you go to a bone specialist, sometimes they're DOs. Uh, I don't know how that relates, but they, the theory is they work from the inside out. MDs work from the symptoms outside in to your body. And now, what does homeopathic doctors do? Homeopathic doctors deal with, uh, I just, I'll shorten it and say home remedies, but uh, they deal with all kinds of blood work. Look at your blood and see where you're lacking, where you need this, where you need that. Um, and you've probably all experienced it sometime or another that you know you really ought to be taking more CoQ10. I mean, if you're going to take something for your cholesterol, you need to take. CoQ10 to help balance it. And fish oil will help. So now we're, we're dealing with three medicines there, and I happen to have two for my cholesterol, so I'm up to four medicines. 
And then you got a wife who says you really ought to take a probiotic and you ought to take this, you ought to take that. Anyway, uh, so uh, homeopathic doctors, they also deal, they think, believe from the inside out because they're dealing pretty much primarily with your blood. But more natural. It's more natural. They use not prescriptions, but they use natural. Okay, so spiritual practices like having prayer can play a role in healing. Um, we're often taught uh, in seminary and taught when you um, visit someone who is sick, you don't quite know what it is, you have prayer, Sometimes I'll share it with you and sometimes not. Um, I called on one lady when I was on internship and I must have called on her for six months every other week. And finally the senior pastor said to me, you know, she's an alcoholic. Oh. You know, and so my prayers were very general because I didn't know, you know, what exactly. And, and you don't go in as a pastor and pray for somebody's gallbladder or something like that. You pray for strength to face surgery or strength to recover from surgery, whatever it is. Um, you try to deal with it that way. But, you know, you're, I told the story of, of seeing Mary Beth. I don't know if it was in a sermon or or in this class. Uh, that was my first hospital call ever. I hadn't had training when I went on internship. I told it in here. I did not have the training before internship because they asked me to go early. So, um, yeah, she healed me. Uh, I knew she was having her eighth or ninth surgery, whatever it was, and uh, that's all the pastor said to me. I'm going on vacation, Mary Beth, blah, 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 is going to the hospital, and she's going to have surgery on Monday, and a call would be very good. That was the days when pastors could just walk right in and walk right to rooms. It, it was a different, it's been a different world. I've seen it evolve from a pastoral viewpoint as to how hospitals treat pastors. Some still treat them very well. Some don't. Okay, so what we're saying is patients' attitudes, including those Jesus healed, can play a big role in recovery or preparation for a calm death to be prepared for whatever comes. Copenhaver's example of the doctor he talking about himself in his book where he has atrial fibrillation, which I know all about and still have, and uh, going ultimately his doctor giving him two prescriptions, one for a pill each day and the other for 30 minutes of prayer to slow his life down, to meditate. Meditation is a great, great healer. I only have one problem with meditation. That's falling asleep. <laughs> uh, but just to meditate and have your thoughts there, you know, just to, to think, uh, to sit there, tip back in your lazy boy, whatever it is, and think about Jesus. Jesus is my Savior. And you don't have to say anything for a while, you know, Jesus died on a cross for me. And, and go through all the things that Jesus relates to. Some days maybe you think of the word mercy. And we thought of that mercy when we were talking about what? Compassion, if you recall, that very first week. So that's what meditation and prayer can do for you. And people say, I forget, what, what, what all can I pray for? 30 minutes, 30 minutes. 
half of prayer is listening. Boy, Pastor Bruce had a class on prayer, and there's some little still brochures up here, uh, cards to take with you that can talk uh, and tell you a little bit about, let's see, uh, personal prayers from Colossians. And there's ways to praise God. They're still free to take these, aren't they, Bruce? Okay. Um, you know, build in me a strong faith. Fill me with knowledge in you. Fill me with knowledge of your will. Uh, just think of all those, both sides, 31 of them. That's one for every day, but pray them every day. Um, so there's a good example uh, of someone who's just too busy in life doing things. They don't stop to take time. Okay, so how does prayer help? Prayer helps us, as people of faith, by placing ourselves in God's hands to share our need. Put ourselves in God's wavelength. To say, Lord, I don't know what's wrong, but help me know which way to turn for help. It's a good way to put it. Um, just put yourself, and I, these are that's one of my slogans, place yourself on God's wavelength, is what prayer is all about. We trust that God is hearing our need. We listen when our, and we usually fight it, we usually fight it, we listen when our innermost need being says, go see a doctor. You immediately walk to the telephone, lift it up, and, and <laughs> that's funny looking that, that way. Um, Peg's going to look at this later, but on her birthday, her grandson called her, and Joseph's about, I think he's 23, something like that, <laughs> but he Facebooked her. And so <laughs> the phone rings, and he says, Hi, Grandma, this is Joseph. And she says, hi, Joseph, how are you doing? He says, Grandma, don't put it up to her ear. Put it in front of you so you can see me. <laughs> but what do you do You know, when the phone rings? Unless you have my kind of hearing aids, which I can adjust to hear the phone ring and talk to someone. It's very clear uh, coming this way. Find a doctor who at least understands that you are a person of faith. And sometimes you have to help the doctor understand that faith is not a noun, it's a verb. We talked about that when we did faith and doubt. Faith is a verb. Prayer needs to include listening and questioning. Ask God a question. He's not going to give you an answer just like that but he will guide you, or she will guide you to an answer. And, and that's, that's just growth there. When, you know, when I have a few Baptist friends who always pray, Dear Heavenly Father, you know, and for them I like to say, Dear Heavenly Mother, uh, you know, my God is God of all creation. So, God needs listening and questioning. Okay, healings in the Bible are relational between the healer and the one who is healed. Jesus' healings are made possible by the relationship between the human with a need and the divine being. So when the divine being, Jesus, encounters a man paralyzed for 38 years. What does he ask? Do you want to get well? Of course he wants to get well. But this is Jesus' question to get the man participating in his healing. Jesus encounters a blind man crying out for help. Remember, he calls, Son of David. And Jesus, the responds, what do you want me to do for you? 
another question. These are Jesus' questions. Does Jesus need to ask? No. Do the men need to answer? Yes. So Jesus invites us into that healing relationship. Why did I say no? Does Jesus need to ask? He already knows the need. He already knows the need. So when we talk about the need for prayer, we are speaking to our relationship with God. We're speaking to our relationship with God. Was that something I added in that wasn't there? It's all there, okay. Okay, and Jesus shows respect for those he heals. His questions relate to the one in need, relates to them as a human being. Think of that in terms of um, the quadriplegic or the blind person or the leper who is ostracized by other people. Um, he doesn't define them by their disability. He sees them each as a human being. His questions invite them into a healing relationship. That's a repeat of what I said. The centurion's daughter who comes and says, you know, my daughter several miles away in my house uh, seems to be dying. And Jesus invites the centurion then into a relationship and says, I will go with you. And by the time he gets there, the little girl is healed. So it isn't any hocus pocus that Jesus lays on her. It's a relationship. Or another is blind Bartimaeus, which we talked about already. He shows his faith in Jesus and asks for the gift of sight. And Jesus says, your faith has healed you. Your trust has healed you. Okay. This is Jesus' favorite word. His favorite question. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? It's repeated in a variety of ways at a variety of times. Um, so, we ask the question, do we see healings today? Do we see healings today? I'm just going to put a couple of up there. Heart problems, asthma, arthritis, broken bones mended, muscles reattached. I mean, think of every time you watch a football game, somebody's carried off, got ACLU tear or something like that. Cancer's cured. All those things we take for granted. But do we give thanks to God? Thanks to God every day that they are done. How did prayer help? Prayer sets you at somewhat at ease. It helps the spirit, if not the physical. It helps your strength. Placing the problem in God's hands, the relaxation which can follow. Um, I wish I had Westberg's book on good grief here where he he talks about that. He also has another book entitled Minister and Dr. Meat. But these books are 50 years old. And yet he foresaw that we were going to have this separation of faith and body. Um, but you can relax more if you place it in God's hands. And say, you know, just give me some help, some relaxation. Now, the question comes up, did Jesus heal everybody who was asking him? And Copenhaver asked that question uh, in the book, and he answers it that Jesus did not heal everybody. Jesus healed, from our perspective in the Gospels, all who came to him with openness to be healed. All who came to him with openness to be healed. And so, 
Um, he didn't pick specific people to heal. That's what I'm saying. It was as if, gee, guys, today we, we have to go over to Nazareth uh, because of something that needs heat, someone who needs healing. Or I'm going to go over across the sea to uh, the demoniacs that are over there and we'll pick one out and we'll heal that demoniac that's there. That wasn't the way he operated. He came and those who came to him, he would ask questions. There are a couple healings where he does specifically reach out and do it. Um, as he encountered the need, you know, think of the story of the paralytic by the pool at Siloam. You know, why don't you do what everybody is, I'm paraphrasing here, why don't you do what everybody else does, and when the pool begins to bubble, why don't you go down in there? And the man says, what? I can't get there in time. Other people with other, and that was what their faith was, what their understanding of the healing nature of that pool was. And so Jesus has initiated on that particular one, but not on very many. Okay. We want to change gears here. This one hopefully won't be quite as long. But we'll go to questions about abundance. Any questions about healing before I go on? Let's start right there. Okay. We're all well. We'll go to questions about abundance and we're going to read Mark 6, 31 to 34. Matthew, Mark. Now note, you know, as we've said before, Mark 9, chapter 9, is the mountaintop for Mark. It's where Jesus is asked Peter, who do you say that I am? And then he heads to the cross. Up to that point is where ministry is. It's an easy way to try to remember Mark. If we look at, at Mark 6, 31 to 34. Um, yeah, we started 30, I guess. Um, yeah. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. See how that works? For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Is that's now there what? You can meditate on that phrase for a long time. They were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now very late. Send them away, send them home, so that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. Excuse me buy something for themselves to eat. Note there's a little bit of selfishness there. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, are we to go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread? You know, denarii was a day's wage back in the, those days. And give it to them to, to eat. And he said to them, how many loaves have you? Go and see. When they had found out, they said, we found five and two fish. This one little kid out here, he's got them in a styrofoam package. 
And his mother told him to stop McDonald's and get before he came out to listen to this Jesus guy. Then he ordered them, Jesus, ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. That's to be able to control the situation that he has them in group, groups. You know, how does that relate? If you can remember back to our community dinners, we get numbers for our tables, remember? So you have, don't have everybody rushing up there at once to the, to the uh, kitchen. So he ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. Verse 40. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and of fifties. Taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven, and he blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and he divided the two fish among them all. And all the... I'm reading with a little helper here. And all ate and were filled, and they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. Those who had eaten the loaves numbered 5,000. So that's the feeding of the 5,000. It's a unique miracle. Unique miracle because what actually happened what actually happened there, we're not sure. But it was seen as a miracle. Miracle literally means a sign that points to God. Something happened that points to God. So once again, I'm going to visit the parables and see how many relate to this subject. The definition of abundance here is a great or plentiful amount, fullness overflowing, affluence or wealth, um, abundant, occurring in or marked with abundance, plentiful, abundant with, rich. Those are all various things that you'll find from different uh, dictionaries. So, a word or idea that's used many times in the Bible, abundance is used many, many, many times. Sixty-six times in the Bible there are stories of abundance, seven of which are in the Gospels. Money, let's see, abundance used 66 times, you're going to add these up. Money is used 137 times in the Bible, 16 in the Gospels, Two in the Gospel of John. 16 in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I should say. Rich is used 105 times. So now you're up to 242, you're 308, I guess. Um, 18 in the Gospels. 13 of those rich are used in Luke. Riches is used 65 times. Wealth is used 74 times. Zero in the Gospels. As a former stewardship director who would go out and preach in churches and speak at church lunches for five years and meet, meet with church consuls, Money in abundance is talked about more than any other subject in the Gospels by Jesus. He talks about money in abundance more than any other subject. So, a quick look at the parables and the abundance and stewardship of possessions. Here's Jesus' teachings, just some of them. Two debtors, hidden treasure, pearl, treasures, good Samaritan, foolish rich man, unfruitful fig tree, great banquet, lost sheep, lost coin. Uh, then we got another, look at that, prodigal son, dishonest steward, rich man and Lazarus. The list goes on so that you begin to see how many times Jesus talked about the stewardship of possessions. And his big question is to the disciples, 
How much bread do you have? How much bread do you have? And you all know the story. It's time for retreat to get away. People follow. The hour becomes late. Disciples are concerned about the people. And Jesus says, you get them something to eat. Me? Moi? I can't afford that. Jesus says, give what you have. And they discover five loaves and two fish. And they all ate, and there were 12 baskets full left over. 12 being uh, a good spiritual number from 12 tribes, 12 apostles. You can go on that. This is the only miracle that occurs in all four Gospels, feeding the 5,000. But in Matthew, I got a double colon in there. In Matthew 15 and Mark 8 talks about feeding 4,000. That's in addition to the stories about feeding the 5,000. And they all come after. Matthew and Mark come after feeding the 5,000. Jesus describes, decides to feed the crowd. The disciples are upset. How can we do that? Have they forgotten already? that he fed 5,000 when they encountered the 4,000. It's one of the, you know, some of the scholars say these are the same story told in two different ways. Uh, I happen to believe it's two separate occasions because why would the disciples have forgotten already and why would it be four and the number of fish and, and bread is, is different? Um, so Jesus asked the very same question. How much bread do you have? Don't you think Jesus just wanted to slap him upside the head sometimes? Like <laughs> <laughs> Joe said, don't you think Jesus just wanted to slap him upside the head sometimes? Um, I don't know if that's where he would have slapped him, but I think he'd like to shake him. Yeah. <laughs> he'd like to shake them. Uh, say, did you forget? So, what answer could Jesus have been looking for? He's looking for an answer. There's somebody who's got one. He knew they had very little. Could he have been wanting to hear plenty or enough to go around? I don't know. But could he have been? Is it a possibility? Copenhaver says this. I love it. If God wanted to multiply the loaves and the fish, or even make those fish waltz in three-quarter time, God could do that. I just think that was cool. Okay. Now we're going to talk quickly about a theology of abundance and a theology of scarcity. This approach affirms that there is enough. Through God's generosity, there is enough. And today, there is enough in the world. And I mention that in just a minute. God continues to provide abundantly for God's people. Feeding the 5,000 is a theology of abundance versus a theology of scarcity. And so Jesus was talking about the abundance. The disciples were just thinking about scarcity, what they actually had in their pockets. Scarcity people are always sure there's not enough. They become protecting of what they have for fear and self-concern. So they protect what they have. Sunday's paper, this past Sunday, mentioned we do not consume 17% of our daily food in the United States. In other words, take all the meals that everybody ate at supper or at dinner, whatever you call 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, take all those. 17% of that food that was spread before us was not eaten. Um, Peg and I went to Taco Bell last night, and 
she didn't think they put any sour cream on her tacos. I, I, I do not eat sour cream. But I did last night because they ended up only giving me two regular tacos. I wanted three. So she got three that she didn't think had sour cream in. So I went up to tell the guy, and they found the manager, and the manager finally shouted something. They weren't that busy to those uh, who were fixing the food. And then all of a sudden, Peg said, I found it. Yeah, it's got a little bit of sour cream in it. Well, then the manager comes out with a bag of three more with sour cream on them. So um, what are you going to do with them? Well, I ate one to make my three tacos, hard shell. Uh, what are you going to do with the other two? Peg said, I'm going to give them to those two guys. I think they were high school kids sitting over in the corner. So she went over and gave them to them. That way it got consumed. But normally we don't consume everything. Think of what we put back uh, for leftovers that sit in our refrigerators for a long, long time, and then they get thrown out. In our house, only one person eats leftovers. Moi. Moi. I had a good friend where I started my first mission in California, in Colinga. John Swanson was the rector of the Episcopal uh, church there. Very small church, probably seated, I don't know, 150 at, at most, something like that. And I participated, it was really neat, in what they call the consecration. We make a big deal in the Lutheran church when we get the building built. And we dedicate it, right? They make a big deal out of getting the church paid for and then they consecrate it. And, you know, the bishop stands outside the door with his crozier knocking on the door like this. And then the president of the congregation and says, Who goes there? You know, and he says, I am the bishop of the church in San Joaquin Diocese or something. What do you want? You know, and they have this dialogue that goes back and forth between getting into the church. And it was kind of a neat thing. But John taught me to have luck potlucks. He said, if we had a potluck, which would, back 50 years ago, you had a lot of potlucks in churches. If we had a potluck, you sign up. Vegetable, salad, potato, or meat. And he said, we'd never get enough people to sign up for meat. And so they started having luck potlucks. They just took a chance that everybody would bring enough to eat. And they always, he said, we always had enough meat. A lot of people brought it that didn't bring it before. And they had, people would bring two dishes instead of one. And think about that. There's always that worry when you're going to have a potluck. You know, are we going to have enough? Are we going to have enough? Um, okay, so that was John Swanson's. He, he was an interesting guy. He drove this real old Chevy. And uh, so he decided after I got there, I'd been there about a year, he made the decision with his consul that he was going to go to Zimbabwe for a year of mission work while the missionary from Zimbabwe would be coming over to take care of his church. They just did kind of a swap. <laughs> and poor, the poor priest who came uh, to take his place, that car was always breaking down. I mean, it was old, and he hadn't taken care of it. And so the people of the church basically got the priest a better used car to drive around. Was everything covered the countryside out there. Jesus' question and me, you can all say that. And it's not Dean, it's each and every one of you. Does Jesus, how much bread do we have, relate to our thinking? Now think not just of bread, but think of 
how much food do we have? Stuff. You know, stuff. We have lots of stuff. Okay. Do we think about our own life? Do we worry about our own abundance? What about those who don't have enough? My question is simply, how much is enough? There was a book written on that about 20 years ago. But think of what you have. A comfortable house, clean water and food, vacation time or retirement. I'm 152 days away from leaving on vacation. Um, who keeps track of those things? I do. I do. Utilities, automobile and gasoline, even though the prices are going up. Clothes. How much is enough? And so we ask those questions. Love this little guy. Okay. Now let's look at feeding the 5,000 from another view. From another view. Was Jesus hinting to the disciples to check their own pockets? Had they brought anything along to munch on? You know, did they have a diet bar or something, an Atkins bar? Or, you know, did they say, well, I'm going to be out there all day? When you go to play golf, you usually take some munchies along if you're going to be there over the lunch hour, or that's why they sell all those crackers in the in the starter shacks um, to make sure you have something. But was Jesus hinting to the disciples to check their pockets? Might this miracle have been a spreading of abundance where everybody chips in? that Jesus could have said to the disciples, how much do you have? And they all, I haven't got anything. Oh, oh, here's Billy. He's, he's got a styrofoam box of, of some fish and, and uh, bread right here. Uh, so we've got uh, five, loaves, five little loaves of bread and some couple of fish. Well, then there was a guy in the next row said, well, if he's going to give his dinner or his lunch to us, then maybe I ought to chip in with what I brought along. And somebody else over here wants to chip in what they brought along. And pretty soon you have an abundance and there's 12 baskets full left over. Could that have been what happened? Had it been, everybody chipping in, had this happened, would this have made it any less of a miracle? I'm looking for heads to be going this way. It would have been just as great of a miracle had it happened in that way. So no matter how, it's not just a miracle people see Jesus perform, but now you have a miracle in which they participate not just by eating, but by contributing. Abundance. There's a little boy. Okay. So what is your bread contribution? We think our gifts and our talents are so little. Think of Jesus talking about a pinch of yeast, a woman losing a penny and sweeping the kitchen, a mustard seed. The farmer, the farmer at prosperity is the one that I think about, a bread, prop, bread con contribution. I, I know I've told some of you this story, that um, the last, when I was a stewardship key leader with the National Church, which I did for five years, uh, together with being stewardship director at South Carolina. Um, I flew all over the country, mostly east of the Mississippi. I did do one job in, in Omaha because we had three key leaders in Minnesota, one in Spokane, and one in L.A., 
one in Texas. There were just two of us east of the Mississippi. So I, I covered Boston to Fort Pierce, I think was as far south as I went in Florida. But anyway, the last job I did, it was after I had moved here, was in Prosperity, South Carolina. Little burg in the middle of farm country. And uh, a great pastor, great pastor. Um, and they wanted to put on an addition on their priority list was a gymnasium type of fellowship hall so that the kids could come in after school and play basketball. Um, and um, so they wanted to do this, not only have me preach and, and do my, my thing, our program, which I would preach twice, um, but to also speak to a uh, church dinner. And I mean, they really put on a dinner. And they packed the people into what they were using for a fellowship hall, which was fairly good size. And afterwards, uh, after I did my spiel and told them how they all could be a part of this and everything, and their goal was $300,000, which was a smaller goal for us going out to do that. But um, I gave my spiel, and afterwards, this fellow came up, I can't remember, like this. Uh, he had some had a kind of dirty white T-shirt on and a pair of coveralls. And a pair of coveralls only had one strap. I always remember that. And he says, Pastor, I really, really would like to do something for this. But he said, I just don't have much. Do you ever take property? I said, yes, we always willing to take property. And, and, and you know, and, and you have to go through a lot of rigmarole to get it. But um, yeah, we do. He says, well, I have some land out there on, uh, on Lake Moultrie. And uh, I was going to build on it one day, and then my wife died, and, and so he said, I just stuck with my little place I got here. I'm happy here, and I like my church. And so, you know, maybe I could give that piece of land out there. I said, well, probably could. And uh, I said, but how big is it? He said, he said it's, it's an acre and a half. And I said, that's cool. I said, we will put the sentence lawyer in touch with you so that you can draw papers to give that to the synod, who in turn will then give it to Grace Prosperity. And um, he said, OK, I have your word on that. And I took his name and his phone number and all that. And the lawyer did get in touch with him. Um, remember now the goal was three hundred thousand uh, dollars. We ended up selling that piece of property for one hundred fifty thousand. It was on the lakefront, and all of Columbia was starting to move up that way, north of Columbia. And um, as a result of that, he gave half of the whole contribution, and didn't even realize that he was able to do that. Um, it all starts with what we have in our pockets. Mother Teresa had three pennies and a dream. And when she went to her archbishop or bishop, whatever it was, to say she wanted to start an orphanage, he said, where are you going to get the money? And she says, I've got three pennies. And you all know the rest of history of that. Millard Fillmore, Habitat for Humanity. It now builds in thousands of places and in hundreds of countries, which we usually don't hear about. We hear about when they're doing one in Fruitland Park or Lady Lake or somewhere like that. Um, I think of a bread contribution. I think of the church, last church I served, 
in Vance, South Carolina. Uh, it was a mission that had been started a year before by roughly four or five families, maybe. They had had a, put an ad in the weekly paper uh, that said, uh, are there any, any people who are interested in beginning a Lutheran church in the area, please meet at such and such. It was, uh, it was kind of like, like a Ponderosa steakhouse or something on Thursday evening at six o'clock. And um, there was the organist who, whose husband was, happened to be a doctor. Um, there was a guy who owned uh, a building materials company. There was uh, a fellow who was the general manager of the cement plant. And there was one other one who really, oh, there was a couple from Iowa. He was a retired engineer that lived there. He was, he was kind of a character, old Herb. Um, but anyway, they went there and there were 30 people showed up. Well, as they tell the story, 15 of them were realtors wanting to sell them property. <laughs> uh, but those basic 15 then began to spill out just a little bit, inviting others to become interested. And before they started the church, they started a food pantry in the organist brother's little shack downtown. Uh, and I mean, it was nothing, it looked like an ice shanty, uh, looked like your garden shed kind of place. And we worked out of there uh, two or three days a week. Now when I got there, another church had jumped in from up in Ohio with their foundation and all their building trade, it's really a neat thing, they're still doing it. The building trades people who belong to that church in January and February every year go south somewhere. Bricklayers, carpenters, all those people, they go south and help struggling missions or missions wanting to get started. And they built a 2,400 square foot room uh, 40 by 60, and we did everything in there. Um, women of the church, Boy Scouts, uh, food pantry, later operated out of that. When we decided to enlarge it, the first thing they said is, we've got to put a food pantry there because they want us to get out of downtown. There's too many rats running around in the one we had. Um, and by then the scout troop had grown so we needed a special room for them to store all their tents and everything. Just you watch that thing just grow like that. And then we wanted to um, build the sanctuary ultimately. Um, and it's amazing when you start doing something like that how the things steamroll, you know, snowball. And uh, I told one of uh, my neighboring pastor who was 17 miles away, um, I mentioned to him that we were, we were hoping to build. And he said, well, you really ought to talk to Johnny Evans. He's president of our church and he owns Evans Construction Company. And they do big buildings in Columbia and everywhere. So we talked to Johnny Evans and Johnny Evans said, well, I know a guy uh, who we could probably get to draw something up uh, won't cost you anything. I don't know if he ended up paying for it or not, but this guy was a retired architect and he drew up what was going to be the church. And uh, so it was, um, it just started steamrolling and then you got so, um, the, the gifts would come in from non-members. Well, the biggest gift that came in were the the building was the first building was built was 13 acres, 13 acres of cotton field, and uh, came from a good Lutheran who had moved up all the way to Newberry. But she saw, heard what was going on, 
So she gave the land. And so now we had a builder and we had the architects drawing up stuff and, and we're putting all the pieces together and deciding what we can afford and how much it's going to cost and um, put price tags on all kinds of things. My dentist, um, I was in to see her and, and she was a good Methodist and she said, uh, uh, is there anything significant within the church that hasn't been purchased yet? And I said, well, we got one stained window, has been, they were plexiglass, but one stained window was paid for, but the other one wasn't yet. She said, well, how much is that? I said, 5000 She said, the check will be in the mail tomorrow. You know, think you just, when the Spirit of God starts working, things start steamrolling. That's the way it used to be. I don't know if it is anymore. I got down here, I had served them for five years and then stayed there as the Synod Director of Stewardship and Mission because uh, I was never there. <laughs> Peg sang in the choir, but uh, I would usually be on the road on Sundays. But uh, so we got here and we were here about two, three years. And they called and said, could you come up and preach? We're ready to burn our mortgage. $400,000 what that church cost. So, you know, it was a church that was built for the size people we had, but uh, it just, and it's still going strong. And uh, the, um, their food pantry is still very, very strong. Anyway, Jesus questions. Why do you think he answered so few questions? You take these with you and think about them. Why do you think he answered so few questions? Which questions are the most inspiring, boring, perplexing, and loving? And if you could ask Jesus just one question, knowing that he would answer, what would that question be? We may be able to get into that a little bit next week. Because next week, we're going to have the questions which Jesus answered. And I thank you for bearing with me for all this time. And... Uh, Hope that you'll all go in peace and serve the Lord and be back next week when we have all the questions that Jesus answered and we'll look at them. Anything else to bring before?